Uh, thank you, Mariel. Thank you, Hans, for inviting the team for inviting me. It's very kind of you. Um, so I've been asked to talk about make an impact after the impact. So I assume I'm supposed to go, it's not a cardiac arrest, it's a head injury. We're going to talk about impact brain apnea. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, I, we were told this about this case, Luke. Now, in the UK, Luke is, an, is a name of people who are is a younger, middle-aged sort of people. Elderly people aren't called Luke. So I put a picture of someone who I thought might be a Luke in here. <laughs> but that's really important, because you make judgments on little things that you hear. And you can see here he's also hit the table on the way down and other things. But what you see, and this is going to become quite relevant, is really important. But I'm going to come back a bit more, and someone's already suggested that, and come back a bit, a bit more about that in a minute. Um, my interest as a neurosurgeon is all about preventing secondary brain injury. You all know about primary brain injury when your head hits the windscreen or your, your head hits the floor. There's not much you can do to prevent that other than preventing falls or road safety design, all the primary public health care kind of things. But once your head has hit the windscreen or hit the floor, everything after that is secondary injury. So the hypoxia, the hypotension, the expanding extradural, all those things will go on to cause uh, secondary brain injury. And there's a, we've got a real interest uh, over the last few years of something called impact brain apnea, which is something I wasn't really aware of. I never got taught it at medical school. And this is a phenomenon that we thought we were seeing uh, with our work with London's Air Ambulance, um, uh, where people would not be breathing on scene. And it wasn't a loss of airway, it was just an apneic uh, phenomenon. And I've probably only seen it maybe once or twice in my career pre-hospitally. Uh, I've certainly seen it more um, in hospital. Um, but just to show you, it's a, it's a thing that happens in animals. Uh, uh, it's well recognized in animals. So this is a, a dog. Um, in, it's quite a long while ago, 1896, OK? Uh, and this dog had a um, metal plate. It's not funny for the dog. Uh, the dog had this metal plate stuck to the side of its head. And then Kramer came along and shot the metal plate on the side of the head's dog, dog's head. And you can see the dog was breathing away quite happily here. And then it gets hit, and dog stops breathing. And then dog resuscitator comes along with dog bag valve mask and resuscitates dog, and dog starts breathing again. Now, if dog resuscitator doesn't come along, dog dies. And this is an apneic phenomenon. And, you might, and those of you who are really interested in this kind of thing might like to know that during this period, there's a bit of a catecholamine surge and blood pressure goes up. And if you don't resuscitate, there's a bit of, there's a, in other experiments, they've shown there's a bit of a, um, a cliff edge here where people fall off and they have a, a cardiovascular collapse, or uh, animals do. But it's well known in animals, and it doesn't matter what um, animal you take, whether you take cats, dogs, monkeys, rats, whatever, and it doesn't matter what decade you hit them in, or, and it doesn't matter how you hit them with blood bullets, concussive gunshots, fluid, they all stop breathing, and the harder you hit them, the longer they stop breathing for. And this happens in all animals, so it must happen in humans as well, but we're not aware of it because we're not there, we don't see it, we only turn up after like four or five minutes, in which point they're either fixed and dilated, blown pupils over their died from their head injury, uh, or, they're, uh, or they're breathing again, and, and, they're, um, and they've got over the apneic period. But this is where I see it most commonly, is patients who are brought into our resus department. The next day, we do a CT scan, and they've got this, loss of gray white. Um, they've had a hypoxic brain injury. This is a guy who came off his motorbike. He died. Um, and um, uh, he, on his death certificate, it said traumatic brain injury was his cause of death. And I would like to argue that he didn't die of a traumatic brain injury. He died of a hypoxic brain injury secondary to trauma. And the reason that's really important to emphasize um, is because if we're going to minimize the secondary brain injury, we have to identify what that secondary brain injury is. And he's not got blood in his head. He's not got a horrific brain injury from blood going everywhere. Um, he's had a hypoxic brain injury. Whether that's due to obstruction or whether that's due to apnea, I don't know. But I think a significant number of them are probably apnea-related. And the person I know who saw most impact brain apnea was a guy called John Hines, who I'm sure many of you know here. Sadly, John um, died a few years ago in, um, uh, uh, in motor one of his roles as a motorbike um, doctor following the Scaries uh, race. Uh, but he would um, quite regularly see people come off their motorbike, take their helmet off, they'd be grey, ashen, big pupils, he'd bag them for a little while, and they'd start breathing again. And um, anyway, so if you can get on scene within seconds, I think we'd probably see a little bit more of it. I'm just going to mention this very briefly because I'm moderately interested in this. Um, concussion is a term I really don't like, but if you go through the history of concussion, it was first described by this guy, uh, Ray, um, Ray Zies, in, in sort of like in the mid 900s. And they went through uh, this uh, commotion cerebri and commotion uh, uh, contusion cerebri, different terms for sort of motion and, and contusions in the head. But in the sort of 1800s, concussion included a period of apnea. Right? When they were regularly hitting people over the head for punishment reasons, <laughs> they'd observe the apnea. We don't do that anymore, so we don't really see this. Uh, then concussion came along, and uh, uh, the other terms of concussion meant that um, you know, we had a loss of consciousness. Then we've lost the element of loss of consciousness, and now concussion can really just mean you don't feel quite right after you've had a head injury. So we've gone through this whole spectrum of what concussion um, uh, really means. But I think I want to emphasize that it did used to include a period of, uh, of apnea. Right. Um, the, I also mentioned a bit about the cardiovascular collapse. Um, so um, 
This is a bit of work uh, done by uh, Kenzo Sussex, Richard Lyon and his team, but actually there are a lot of other papers that have shown the similar sort of thing. That a significant number of patients who have a high, uh, who have an isolated uh, head injury have a, a, a hypotensive period. And it's about 13% of, in our own audit figures of about, uh, of our code red patients, uh, it's about that much. Uh, Mahoney, uh, a few years ago, showed a similar sort of uh, figure. These people are hypotensive just from an isolated uh, brain injury. And that very much goes against the ATLS teaching of you cannot be shocked from an isolated TBI. What ATLS was trying to say was that you can't bleed enough inside your head to make yourself hypotensive. But certainly a brain injury can make you hypotensive um, for because of, sort of the cardiac and, and brain links that we don't really understand uh, yet. It was because of all this impact brain apnea stuff that I really got interested in um, trying to find ways of minimizing it. And we kind of came up with a solution that um, uh, there are lots of people, uh, doctors, nurses, paramedics, firemen, policemen, who are trained in holding an airway open, basic life support. And how could we alert those uh, to uh, impact brain apnea, for a traumatic incidents that are near them? That's where this really came from. It's a good TAM project that we set up about four or five years ago now. Um, it obviously has a much bigger role in cardiac arrest, um, although in some places now it's going back to being used for trauma as well. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute, if that's okay. Um, but to, and I'm afraid he's already alluded to this. If you have a cardiac arrest in a hospital, your chances of survival are around 50%, uh, which is, but most people in the hospital are pretty sick. Um, if you have a cardiac arrest in the streets of London, your chances of survival are about 9%. But most people, believe it or not, walking around the streets of London are reasonably healthy. Um, in Heathrow Airport, the similar sort of people uh, have a survival of about 80%. So what's the difference there? It's about uh, the fact that Heathrow Airport has an AED on every other gate, and all air crew are trained in CPR and basic life support. So you're getting hyper-acute, quick, uh, reasonably good quality CPR and AED use in Heathrow Airport, unlike the streets of London. So the idea was, was how can we um, uh, um, uh, improve on that? And um, uh, so we set up Good Sam, as I say, with these main uh, core principles, uh, which is uh, not for profit. I should have I had a slide at the beginning, which is my conflict of interest, which didn't seem to show, but uh, I'm an unpaid medical director of it, so it's not a very good conflict of interest. But it's, um, uh, uh, but it's, uh, well, I'm trying, I'm working on it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and so as I say, we don't, it's a not-for-profit funded by Nesta, which is the UK uh, sort of uh, charitable uh, funding solution. Uh, it's now got really big over the last four years. It's now used in 30 countries. It's about 50,000 responders in the UK. Uh, it's, mapped, it's got the world's largest AED registry. It's mapped uh, thousands of uh, uh, AEDs um, uh, and also has now a tracking AED function. So it's the only mobile AED registry that we're aware of. So actually, if people have an AED on them in the boot of their car, it, it can track them as well with their phone. Uh, so actually, there's lots of police cars in London, that, for example, that have AEDs on them. We can track them. Uh, so that's where that came from, mostly around cardiac arrest. I'm not going to really focus uh, on the cardiac arrest side of stuff, because what I really want to talk about is something that someone there alluded to about being able to see what's going on on scene. And we've now developed something else to, uh, to enable us to do that. If you think about um, pre-hospital care, sorry, this is a bit slow, and I'm sorry for those of you who've seen this slide before, but the pre-hospital care over the last uh, 100 years has gone a bit like the music industry. So the music industry has gone from wax cylinders to record. None of you know what these are, do you? <laughs> Tapes, CDs, no, <laughs> fine. Um, uh, and the pre hospital care industry has gone from stretchers with wheels, horses, ambulances, helicopters. Um, and the whole music industry has gone over to digital. And, you know, no one buys records anymore. And I'm not saying we can transport patients yet digitally, uh, although that, we're working on that one. But we will be able to see what's going on. And you've got to think about, for those of you who do work in pre hospital uh, settings, you'll be aware that most of the things you do are decisions. The interventions we do, intubation, thoracostomies, thoracotomies, whatever it is, is actually quite a small portion of what we do. The majority of what we bring is actually decision-making um, uh, early on. And I think uh, that if we can make those decisions before we get there, uh, we can help triage uh, more appropriately. And I think that triage is going to be really into two main areas. Triage of um, scene, uh, as in like what the, uh, what the uh, incident looks like, how big is the fire, how many cars are involved, how far has the patient fallen, and triage of patient, what they look like, what, what's their physiology. And you can tell a huge amount through your eyes. And, you know, artificial intelligence is really important, but actually your own intelligence is pretty good too. We're not really using that because we can't, you can't see what's going on on scene. In the video that um, was shown at the start, um, uh, you could have told so much more if you could actually have seen uh, what uh, he looked like. So I'm going to talk briefly about triage of scene. Now, as I say, my Luke uh, was a middle-aged-ish sort of guy who's landed on carpet. Uh, I can see what's going on here. Uh, he's, he's also taken out all this. So he's, this guy's full now. And because I know he's young now, because I've just seen, uh, 
He's unlikely to have had a medical event and then fallen, unlike the other chap, who's more likely to have a medical event than fallen. So all those things are, um, are uh, going in through my differential. Is it someone like this? I basically Googled pictures of people falling downstairs. <laughs> um, has he fallen on carpet? Has he had time to take his glasses off? Yeah. <laughs> Carrying a laptop. There's lots of pictures like this on uh, Google. Um, has he landed? This is a bit more like Luke, or the one in that we've got. Has he landed on concrete? I noticed Luke landed on wooden flooring, because he's in on, but um, you know, has he landed on concrete? Um, uh, uh, these are all still images, and you're learning a lot from Is he doing this? Is he beginning to move a little bit? Well, in which case, he's breathing, isn't he? So, um, so you can tell a lot just by able to seeing stuff um, very quickly. Um, so there's a real delay between me pressing my button and... Is he doing... Well, that's just staged. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but, I mean, you can see, you know, it's... Um, is he trying to get off the floor? Um, but... Th come on. Or is there blood coming from his head? Um, and this is obviously a work-related incident, but, and this will stage as well. But, uh, but at least you can get an idea of what the patient's surroundings are. Uh, you, you make a, within seconds, you don't have to ask any questions. You, you, can, you can just work it out, what's, go, what's gone on, can't you? So that's one, the triage of scene. Then there's triage of patient. And um, uh, so we've developed this bit of software which can open up anyone's mobile phone remotely. Um, no Skype, no FaceTime. Uh, not only can you see what's going on, but you can also measure uh, vital signs through it as well. And I'm just going to show this bit of video, uh, which was commissioned by Simon Carley. Some of you probably know Simon Carley, emergency medicine phys uh, a professor in uh, Manchester. And he went to a gaming company, and he said, I want you to take someone through increasing injury severity scores over one minute. And um, this is relevant to me because it's a head injury. And I want you to imagine now that you've dialed the emergency services and there's a dispatcher sitting on the other end and they're going to ask you those questions like, where do you live, all those kind of things. And then they're going to say, so uh, is he breathing? <coughs> yeah, he's breathing. Uh, is he conscious? Yeah, he's conscious. So actually, uh, we don't need to worry. He's breathing and he's conscious. There's not, it's not an acute emergency. It's not a, 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 you know, a red one call. We've got time to get there. Um, but I want you to imagine, well, that you can actually see what's going on. There's a point in this video where clinicians get really quite concerned. It's usually about sort of now. So is he breathing? Yeah, he's breathing. Is he conscious? Yeah, he's conscious. So he's still on my phone. He's still not urgent. That's okay. But you all know he's sick. He's really sick, don't you? Um, and, um, and that means you can triage more. So he's going to need a tube soon. In a minute, you don't even need to bother going. Um, he's, he's proper. He's proper sick. But you're inferring all that from your eyes. There doesn't need to be any kind of artificial bit on top of that. And uh, yeah, you can not bother going now. Uh, so I was going to give you a little demonstration. Is that, this is why I've got my own laptop here. This is bound to go wrong, so I apologize. But, uh, so what I'm going to do, just for quickness, I'm going to open up my own phone. So, so you type in the page's number. Uh, you all now know my number. So you can give me a ring if you want. Now this is going to be a bit slow, because it's going via... Um, the UK, I think. So it should come to my phone, and I should get a text. He says confidently. Yeah, so I've got a text. It says, um, you know, can we open your phone to see your... Um, uh, uh, to open your phone cameras. So I've got the text here. Um, it will then say, when you click the link, it will say, uh, are you happy to share your location? So I'll share the location. Uh, are you happy to share your microphone? So it now knows where I am. And I'll share microphone and camera. So there, it opens up my uh, camera there. And then if I click on this button here, it should show the video. He says, there we go. Sit. Sorry. There we go. So you can see that, so um, you can see yourselves there. Let me just make it a bit bigger for you. So um, this is a little bit tricky because I've got sort of video myself here now. So you can probably see me here. Um, and you can see there's a little red box around me. Do you see there's some numbers over the bottom of my chin? That's my pulse. So 57, did you see her? Yeah, I'm quite relaxed. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, and not only that, uh, do you mind if I just take, you could actually do everyone? Sorry, uh, it's, a bit, it's, oh, it's really dark, but actually you'll find everyone, you should find it. Do you see what, all the three people in the front there, find all your putting boxes around you all? Oh, we put the lights on, thank you very much. So, uh, you can't really see it because the contrast's not great, but it'll find faces and it'll read everyone's pulse really quickly. So. Um, so this stuff about being able to see what's going on on scene and get your vitals, if you imagine that Luke there a minute ago, the only flaw in this was that she dialed from her landline, which you can't open. <laughs> but, but most people use their mobile now. Uh, it means you can actually um, uh, see uh, what's going on. So, um, I'm all right for time, but five more minutes. Uh, so let me just come back to this. Let me just cancel that call. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Sorry, two secs. Uh, 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 uh. Right. Uh, 
So as I say, we can use this for, we use this now uh, on our air ambulance uh, uh, in Kent, uh, really to see scene, but also to see patients. And it, and it really does make a, a bit of a difference. So for example, um, if someone's got a burn or a scald, we can say, actually, that doesn't really require us to fly uh, for 40 minutes uh, down to Margate to retrieve them. We can, that's OK. And equally, um, it can up, upgrade as well. So often, we would wait for a, a crew report before uh, dispatch. Um, and so, for example, if you've got a motorcyclist versus car, um, and you can see the patient's agitated um, and got a, a broken leg or something like that, we can, we can work out that's highly likely to be a proper HEMS job uh, and dispatch before we get the crew report. So that, again, it sort of speeds up uh, processes as well. And also, you can, this video can be relayed through iPads and things like that, so actually you can see what you're going to uh, en route. Um, yeah, I've shown you a little bit of that. The really thing I think is really exciting is about being able to deliver care before we get there. And I know Freddie's uh, really looking, or does all this already with telephone CPR. But imagine if you can actually see what they're doing as well and guide them better through CPR. Now, this little bit of video here is a bit unpleasant. And I'm going to show you as an example. Every, all, all videos are unpleasant. This one's being released by the Metropolitan Police. This was a guy who got assaulted in Trafalgar Square about a year ago. Um, it's a horrible bit of video. Um, uh, but um, it shows you what bystanders normally do. And they do the same for road traffic accidents. They all stand around just shocked, as Freddie said at the start. They're, they're, not in the mood, they're not in the mindset to be dealing with this patient. Uh, and so this is someone who gets assaulted. And this guy died of a hypoxic brain injury. Um, and um, you see all these people just standing around, not doing very much. And then, as sad as it is, people start getting their cameras out, videoing. And he's like, actually, if someone was on 9 you could say, look, can you hold his airway open? Can you? So we can actually provide care before we get there. If we can actually see what's going on, we can uh, talk people through what to do. Um, regarding the Good Sam stuff, we've got loads of survivors now. I won't go through this. There's, just, there's loads of survivors. Um, I was going to end on one little bit of video, if that's OK, which just shows, um, uh, which was, was released by Ambulance Victoria. They were one of the ambulance services on Good Sam uh, to try and encourage other um, organizations, such as the fire department, the uh, police, uh, and others, to get on the app. And it was really effective. And I, I, I'll just play it, because I think it's quite a good bit of video. If you can't hear it, um, uh, I will put my microphone down against the, uh, I'll put my head like that, uh, so you can hear it. Um, let's see if it works. I remember having oh, oh, no, that, not, that, having... not that one, this one. It was half time. I walked around the gym for a little bit. I was playing soccer. My legs just gave out from under me. I felt really dizzy. And collapsed. I was unresponsive. And I had no pulse. I had a cardiac arrest. Luckily, a couple of my teammates knew what to do. Someone um, got a defib. The guy started CPR. The defibrillator restarted my heart. When someone is in cardiac arrest, every second counts. The sooner somebody receives CPR and defibrillation, the greater their chance of survival. Saving lives is always a team effort. That's why we've partnered with GoodSam. It's an app that alerts off-duty professionals like you to cardiac arrests nearby. If you're a medical professional or qualified first aider, please join us. Register as a trusted GoodSam responder today. If those guys hadn't been there, or if they hadn't been able to get a defib, I wouldn't have survived. So that's really just to say that all the tech's really important, but actually building the community and creating things like that to encourage community on is just as, uh, is just as important. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, one minute left. There you go. Thank you very much.